Mirrors by Green Searcher, Chapter 8 Best not let anyone catch you in that part of the woods, dear. Belle bit her lip hard, staring at the stranger on the road. She'd been caught. Honestly, it was surprising she'd gone so long without anyone noticing her near daily journey into the forbidden woods. She sucked in a nervous breath, scrambling for an excuse. I, I was just, I mean, I took a wrong turn and... The figure only laughed. No need to be so nervous, child. She replied, I'm no snitch. Belle nodded with some uncertainty, glancing back at the trail behind her. Olive's hoof prints shown in the fresh snow, now obvious evidence of her presence. That could be a problem in the future, she realised anxiously. Max's sharp barks of alarm cut through her thoughts, ringing out in the cold air as he caught up to them on the main road. The old woman flinched, backing away as the dog moved between them and growled protectively. Max! Belle scolded him, sliding out of the saddle and grabbing the animal by the collar before he got too close to the woman. The stranger gripped her teeth, one hand trembling against her walking stick as she backed away. I'm so sorry, Belle said in embarrassment. I don't know what's gotten into him. He's not usually like that unless... She trailed off as she took a closer look at the stranger. A sudden recognition came over her. Oh, you're that storyteller, the one who comes to our village, she realised. The woman relaxed a bit now that Belle had a hold of the dog. At your service, mademoiselle, she said with a weak nod. Belle suddenly recalled the last time she'd seen the woman. She flushed. I, I'm sorry for asking so many questions last time you were in town, she said sheepishly, scratching the back of her head. No need to apologise, child. You were right, after all. Had a few kinks to work out in that tale, the woman winked. Belle thought of the story she had told that night. So strangely similar to the reality of Adam's situation. Though, of course, the prince in that tale was nothing like her friend. Do you come up with your own stories? Belle asked curiously. The woman chuckled. I suppose you could say that. Belle raised a brow at her strange response. Must be a little senile, she thought, chewing her lip for a long moment before going on. Do you think you could? I'm sorry. Because you possibly tell me how the story ends? She finally asked. Almost imperceptibly, the corner of the woman's mouth tugged up. Are you sure? She rasped. It isn't pleasant. A strong gust of wind blew across the open road, sending a chill up Belle's spine. She furrowed her brows but only nodded. The woman held out an empty palm, and Belle reached into her pocket and set a small coin in the old hand. A strange, almost triumphant look crossed the storyteller's wrinkled features. Now, where should I begin? I believe the Enchantress had just cast the curse, Belle prodded. Ah, yes. Before I get started, this version of the story gets really creepy. I mean, Grim Brothers levels here. So just skip ahead a little bit, okay, guys? A couple of minutes? It doesn't take long. She cleared her throat, letting her voice fall into a natural rhythm as she began. Ashamed of his monstrous form, the beast concealed himself inside his castle. As the years passed, he fell into despair and lost all hope of ever returning to the life he had once known. Belle felt a sad tug at her chest. This part of the tale sounded true, at least. However, the woman went on, lifting a shaky finger. Years after the prince's transformation, a beautiful damsel happened upon his forest. While at first frightened by his monstrous form, the beast soon gained her trust. In fact, she quickly found herself growing fond of him, she said with an unnerving smile. Belle felt her heart racing in her chest, for more reasons than one. However, the beast held a dark secret. The woman went on, eyes narrowing. A secret the young woman would only learn of once it was too late. Belle, there's something I want to tell you. But I don't know if I can. Each night, the beast would ask her one question. Fair maiden, will you give me your heart? And each night, she would refuse. But while she cared for him, she could never give her heart to a monster. Or so she thought. In fact, each evening, as the young woman hesitated for longer in her answer, for, after all, his kind gestures and all his beautiful gifts, she found it more and more difficult to refuse him. Belle flushed, 
Feeling the edge of the soft cloak she wore, the notebook suddenly felt heavy in her satchel. One night, she could refuse his request no longer. Yes, dear beast, you may have my heart, the maiden promised. Little did she know, they would be the last words she would ever utter. Little did she know, his transformation was not yet complete. My transformation wasn't exactly instantaneous. The truth was, the prince was becoming more of a beast each day. And a beast. The woman paused, a wicked grin crossing her features. A beast is always hungry. Belle was starting to feel a little sick, suddenly wishing she hadn't asked for the story at all. That night, the damsel slept soundly. As she dreamed of her dear beast, the very creature crept silently into her chambers. He cowered over her sleeping form, watching the rise and fall of her chest with hungry eyes. Yes, the beast truly sought her heart, but not in the way she thought. Consumed by the creature inside, he thrust his claws into her bosom and took the promised heart. Belle gasped and had pressed against her mouth in shock, but the storyteller only continued, crouching in the darkness and the shadows. She paused, licking her lips. He feasted. Stop! Stop! Belle stammered in distress, squeezing her eyes shut. Stop! The woman complied, and Belle was quiet for a long moment. Max whining quietly against her side. I can't believe it, she breathed at last. I'm afraid that's how the tale goes, the woman shrugged innocently. Belle shook her head. I can't believe you really told that story to our village children, she asked incredulously. The woman blanched, clearly not expecting that response. Oh, well, I, I usually water it down for the little ones. I would hope so, Belle said frankly before forcing a smile over her face. Well, thank you for telling me anyway, she said politely, if insincerely. Her desire to leave now tenfold her original desire to hear the tale. She started back towards Olive, mounting once more. Despite the woman's unnerving demeanour, she was quite old. And all alone, on the road, without an animal companion. Belle sighed. Um, will you be all right? I'd, I'd be happy to give you a ride back into town. As long as she doesn't tell me any more stories. Oh, aren't you kind? But I'll be fine. Heading east, after all, the woman replied, leaning heavily on her walking stick as she moved over to the horse's side. She reached up suddenly and held Belle's hand in her own wrinkled fingers. This close, Belle could make out her eyes beneath the hood. A vibrant red, like no eyes she'd ever seen before. While strange, they gave the old woman a peculiar beauty. You be careful now, dear, she told Belle. Wouldn't want you falling prey to this forest's beasts. Belle's eyes grew wide at the comment, but she only nodded. Me merci, madame. You take care as well. The woman held her hand for another long moment, her grip much tighter than her thin fingers would suggest. Just as Belle was starting to grow uncomfortable, the woman let go. Belle gave a civil nod before quickly guiding the horse back down the main road towards her home. Belle! Sir Giles spoke once they were out of earshot. That tale, it isn't. Can you believe that woman? She said furiously before he could finish, spreading that terrible story around the kingdom. It was all I could do not to tell her off for such lies, she huffed. Sir Giles seemed to sigh in relief, chuckling a bit. I am sure she doesn't mean any harm, dear girl. Remember, most in these parts, enchantments as such as ours are utter nonsense. I'm sure she merely wove the tale in order to gather a large crowd. <laughs> Belle huffed. A boorish crowd, perhaps. The swordsman was quiet for a long moment, sensing her unease. Are you quite sure you are right? He asked at last. I understand you sensed any similarities in that story. Belle pursed her lips. In truth, she was upset. Though she only shook her head. I'm fine, Sir Giles. After all, I like to think I can put more trust in my friend than in a tale from a stranger. An odd stranger at that, he said bluntly. She laughed a bit. She was. 
but they do say the same about me back in town. She fell quiet after that, guiding Olive quickly along the road, still unable to push away the terrible images that tale had created in her mind. You are in no danger. Just the memory of Adam's words in the garden put her mind at ease. I trust him, she realised with conviction. The old woman's story had nothing to do with him. Nothing to do with any of them. It couldn't. And she certainly wasn't going to let some foolish tale scare her away from the first real friend she'd ever had. Still, she thought, frowning as she tugged the cloak tighter around her shoulders. I wish I had never asked. Line break. The old woman frowned deeply as the girl took off along the trail. Something told her that story may or not have had the effect she was hoping for. While the tale had clearly upset her, she sensed the young woman was more offended than frightened. No matter, she determined, letting a wry smile pass over her lips. She had taken what she needed. Now it was time to be rid of the girl before she could interfere any further. She hadn't wanted to waste her energy on this. But if she had to, she was certainly going to enjoy it. Perhaps I'll turn her into that pretty cloak she wears, she thought wickedly, or the saddle upon which she rides, she grinned, tucking back one ragged old sleeve and sliding out her wrinkled hand. The spell had no more left her fingertips when a force flung the witch's feet over her head. She landed in a painful heap in a ditch along the road feeling her magic depleting from the failed curse. Groaning, the witch pushed herself up furiously, glaring at the girl and her horse as they disappeared over the hill. Remember, young one, once you cast a spell, it cannot be interfered with. She swore roughly. If she couldn't harm the girl, that could only mean one thing. One of them was already in love. And considering the beauty of the young woman, the witch had no doubt it was him which would make her original plan all the more difficult. She ground her teeth, tugging at the roots of her hair. He wasn't supposed to actually find someone! At least not on his own. Stupid man! She huffed, so quick to offer his heart, so quick to ruin everything she had planned, just like his wretched father. Seething, the witch hoisted herself onto old, shaking feet. At least she got in one thing from the interaction, and that could still prove useful. If only she could stop the young woman from coming back. Foolish girl, she rasped darkly, letting the smile slide back over her lips. You're no rival for me. Line break. Maurice. Yes, my darling. Maurice, I can't stop worrying about Belle. Soleil's husband smiled down at her. Always worried about everyone but yourself. He said it warmly, but she didn't miss the anxious look in his eyes as he set the blood-coated cloth aside. The taste of a wet cough still lingered in the woman's mouth. The terrible ache in her chest never going away. Around them, the dark room was barely visible through her blurring vision. She was tired. Always tired. Don't worry, dear. I'm sure she's perfectly safe. Maurice was saying. She felt a warmth against her hand. Now, please. The doctor said you must try and rest while you can. Soleil frowned, but shut her eyes obediently. It was her own fault Maurice didn't know to worry more. She thought of their daughter, alone in that town for months without them, alone where that man remained. The tightness in her chest growing worse. They should never have left Belle alone. Each branch, each twig, each blade of grass seems clad miraculously with glass over ice-bound streamlet bends, each frozen fern with crystal ends. Well done! Soleil exclaimed, a clapping as Belle finished the recitation and gave a mock curtsy. My English is improving, isn't it, Maman? The teenager asked in the foreign tongue, grinning jiggly. Oh, yes, I couldn't be prouder of you. Belle offered a genuine smile at that. Does that mean I can go continue Guinevere and Lancelot now? For a little while, my love. Papa will be needing our help soon. Thank you, Belle said eagerly, rushing over and kissing her on the forehead. You know, 
I think you're a much better teacher than that mean old professor anyway. Soleil smiled. Though she doubted it was true. She'd done her best with Belle's education, but she only really knew what Marisa taught her, and from the small books that she could get her hands on in the little town. She sighed, wondering how much of her daughter's potential was untapped because of circumstance and her own ineptitude. Her thoughts were interrupted by a rough knock at the door. Frowning, Soleil stood up and moved over quietly, pulling Maurice's contraption from the wall and looking to see who was calling. She gritted her teeth at the view on the other side. Gaston? Belle whispered from behind her. Soleil turned around, nodding, motioning to the girl to take refuge in the loft. Belle grimaced, looking anxious even as she appeared. The knock came again. Belle, I know you're home. Soleil sucked in a furious, albeit nervous, breath. If Maurice was only here. The twenty-year-old man outside filled the porch with his giant frame, already the largest and strongest man in town. In all truth, he frightened her. G Gaston, Belle is not home, she stammered hating the way her voice wavered. And I know my husband has already asked you to stop calling. Ah, Madame Dupont, he said in disappointment. Well, I guess I'll try again later. Young man, did you not hear me? She said sharply, feeling a new burst of courage flood over her. My daughter is 14 years old. She has no interest in your attentions. You are not welcome to call on her. And if you do not stop, we will reach out to the authorities. The man was quiet for a long moment, and Soleil dared to hope he had gone with his rough voice. And his rough voice spoke again. The authorities! <laughs> he got forward. My father owns this town's authorities. He owns all of you. He rasped darkly. His bark of a laugh rang out again. Ha! You can't threaten me. What he said wasn't far from the truth. The village officials were known to accept a well-placed bribe, and most of the residents were in some kind of debt to Monsieur Legume. Even their own fields belonged to the wealthy merchant. Soleil pressed her palms against the door, hands shaking as she looked up towards the loft. Belle's eyes stared down from the darkness, appearing just as frightened as she felt. But speaking of authorities, the deep voice went on. She could almost hear the smirk in his voice. Would be a shame should Maurice do anything odd, he said darkly. Wasn't he the one who threatened our school teacher some years ago? Seems the old fellow has become quite the menace to the village. Indeed, one more violent act. <coughs> he stopped tutting. Tutting. He stopped tut tutting. Well, I got. Well, I can't imagine Maison de Lune would say no to one more patient. Soleil's heart flew into her throat. The authorities wouldn't help them. Maurice couldn't even try to defend Belle without risking the asylum now. Not after his row with the schoolteacher. Or his fit on the hunting trip last summer. Gaston's heavy footfalls faded away. Soleil turned back, leaning against the door as her strength left her. Maman, I'm so sorry. Belle whispered suddenly at her side. This is my fault. I I must have done something that made him think I wanted. You did nothing wrong, Soleil said quickly, pulling her daughter against her and running a hand over her hair. Belle was nearly her height already, yet she curled into her shoulder like she had as a child, holding her tightly. Don't tell Papa, the girl breathed after a moment. Soleil pulled back, frowning deeply. He'll do something foolish. I know it. Belle went on. We can't lose him, Mamal. And how would we ever survive on our own? No. No, I... She paused, sucking in a nervous breath. I would marry Gaston before letting that happen. Don't say that, her mother said, trying not to cry, as she felt entirely hopeless, unable to protect her only child. It'll be all right. I'm sure he'll tire of me soon enough, Belle said, squeezing her mother's hand. Besides... Gaston's pretty brainless. I think I can handle him, she said with a smirk. Oh, Belle, Soleil started before feeling a sharp pain in her chest. She grimaced, grabbing at her breast with one hand, while reaching for a chair with the other. Mama, what's wrong? Belle asked anxiously, helping her sit. Nothing, just a little ache. Probably my nerves acting up, she said, her throat growing dry. 
I'll go start a pot of tea, Belle said, racing into the kitchen. Col Soleil coughed lightly, closing her eyes as a sudden wave of fatigue overcame her. In truth, it wasn't the first time she had felt such pain, but it was the first time she had been able to keep it hidden. She shook her head, knowing she couldn't dwell on such things, not with a daughter to worry about. Belle may be confident that she could handle Gaston, but Soleil wasn't sure that the young man was as dense as he seemed sometimes. For if he was anything like the merchant who had fathered him, well, then he knew how to get what he wanted. Line break. An old woman with bright red eyes climbed through the forest's heavy growth, tucking herself in the shadows. To her right sat the main road of the Northern Pass, worn down by travellers. To her left, a forbidden trail leading to an enchanted castle. Taking a deep breath, she cast her hand forth, the scenery around her changing shape. It was nothing more than an image, a mirage-like spell to ensure anyone familiar with the trail would fail to recognise it for what it was. She sighed, feeling her magic drain even further, but grinning despite her exhaustion. Perhaps she couldn't hurt the girl herself, but nothing was stopping her from changing the image of the landscape. The witch waited impatiently for over an hour before the young woman appeared. She held her breath, watching the girl approach the trail's entry point. She slowed the horse down for a moment, but ultimately continued along the main road. A few minutes later, the girl rode back, frowning as she moved back and forth in search of the path's entrance. The enchantress smirked. Try to find your way back now. A moment later, however, the irritating dog from before started barking, running straight off the road and down along the hidden path. Raising her brow, the young woman rode after him, passing straight through the mirage and finally orientating herself on the hidden trail. Thank goodness for that nose, Max, she exclaimed. I can't believe how different it looks since the snow. The witch in the trees ground her teeth in fury, pulling all the stores she had left and casting a curse at the wretched mutt. The dog turned towards her, cocking his head, but appearing just as alive and as alert as possible. The witch tucked herself further into the shadows, grinding her teeth in irritation. In her anger, she had entirely forgotten her spells didn't work on animals. Well, there goes giving the horse a broken ankle, she thought, wrinkling her nose. Looking back up, she watched in perplexity as the girl dismounted the horse, untying a rake from the saddle and heading back to the start of the trail. Several long minutes passed as she used the tool to raise the prince in the snow. She's smart, the witch realised in annoyance, watching with narrow eyes as the girl finished her task and remounted the mare. Out of options and nearly depleted on her stores, the enchantress now felt nearly as weak and as useless as an ordinary human. I shouldn't have made the jump, she thought with regret. I was too impatient, and now it's left me weak. She sighed as they rode out of sight. It seemed that this task was having to wait until after a good feast. Line break. As the days grew even colder, Belle found herself filling the pages of her new sketchbook faster than she ever realised was possible. How could she not? With so many new things to try her hand at. Several sheets were already dedicated to drawing the castle, inside and out, and a dozen more to its occupants. The latter seemed thrilled at the prospect of a personal sketch, and Belle spent many mornings curled beside a warm fire in the kitchen or library as a small crowd of servants gathered waiting their turn. She still took the horses out each day, and often spared several minutes, as she did, drawing some new scenic landscapes she hadn't witnessed before. It seemed that the lack of travellers through these woods of for a decade had only served to preserve its natural beauty. Adam didn't seem to mind however she chose to spend her time, and often accompanied her in whatever task she had set herself at. Adam, come look at this, she said eagerly during one of her morning rides. She crouched before an old tree stump, a young fir having taken root in its base, springing forth into the canopy overhead. When he didn't respond, she glanced back and noticed him standing stone stiff at the old trail, eyes glued to the ground. Adam, she asked, standing and cocking her head to the side. I, I should stay here with Olive, he said nervously. His ears were pressed against his head as he twisted the reins uncomfortably in his paws. Belle frowned. It was but a few paces away. Surely the horse would be fine for a couple of minutes. 
Adam often expressed an interest in the forest's unique vegetation. A passion, he said, had once been his father's. Now, however, he wouldn't even look at the interesting growth about her. All right, Belle agreed in confusion, standing and moving back as they made their way further along the forest path. Belle soon found herself straying from the trail again, however, to observe some beautiful icicles that had formed in a web of branches nearby. After a moment, however, she noticed something that would make her jump. Claw marks, she realised, her eyes growing wide at the deep, jagged dents in the trunks beside her. She sucked in a nervous breath, wondering if a bear had wandered into these woods. It's all right, Belle, Adam said quietly from behind her, as though reading her mind. Those are mine. Oh, she breathed in some relief, though she couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. She looked back up at the marks in the trees, an old woman's echoing voice through her thoughts. The prince was becoming more of a beast each day. Ugh, she thought in annoyance. I should have never asked for the end of that awful tale. Pushing the foolish thought away, she looked back at Adam, noticing he, again, hadn't followed where she had gone. Adam, is something wrong? she asked. No, I, I'm fine he muttered, looking at his feet. But why are these here? She said, pointing to the marks on the trees around them. They're just markers, he shrugged, still not making eye contact. Markers for what? He frowned deeply, before finally looking up at her with sad eyes. For my prison, he rasped. Belle felt a pang of horror in her gut. Oh, what do you mean? She breathed. He sighed, taking a few silent steps forward. Just a pace away from her, he stopped and reaching out and feeling the air as though something stood in his way. This is as far as I go, he said quietly, letting his arms fall back to his side. But there's nothing, there's nothing here, she said anxiously, reaching out to the empty air he had just touched. No, there isn't. Not for anyone but myself explained blankly. Belle felt her chest growing tight, her hands forming into fists. She trapped you here, she whispered in terrible realisation. You, you can't leave. What's a beast without his cage? He explained bitterly, and Belle could tell they weren't his words. He sighed again. The edge of the palace property is as far as I go. I'm afraid. No, no, there has to be a way around it, Belle said firmly, reaching for his arm and pulling him forward. Maybe I can pull you through. She stopped at the resistance, his paw pressed against an invisible something in the air, the fur flattened by seemingly nothing. She loosened her grip quickly, still holding his palm as she looked up at him. But there, there has to be some way to. Have you tried breaking it? He nodded. The tools all go straight through, and my claws only wear down when I try using them. What about, what about climbing over it? There has to be a top, right? I climbed the highest tree bordering the wall. It was still there. Well, what about digging, or... Bell, he said, stopping her as he looked down to where she held his paw. His fingers curled against his palm. I've tried everything. Belle bit her lip. Of course he had. He had been trapped here for a decade. Who wouldn't have done anything they could to escape? She nodded slowly, moving back to his side of the barrier, unsure of what to say. Come, he said quietly. I'll show you. Line break, flashback. The young prince finally managed to fasten the last button on his vest, pulling on the stiff jacket with some difficulty, before taking several long minutes to secure the laces on his riding boots. He wasn't used to dressing himself, after all. He stood as he finished, staring at his small, still human figure in the mirror, his eyes bloodshot but expression determined. I'm going to fix this, he thought fiercely, pushing the memories of a lost father away as he focused on the task ahead. He turned to the sword lying on the table, picking it up carefully. You're sure this is all right, Sir Giles? He asked nervously. 
Of course, a voice echoed from the object. I am forever at your service, my prince. Nodding, the boy secured the sabre to his belt, taking a deep breath before leaving the room and heading into the hall. The air was filled with hundreds of voices, a mixture of nervous chatter and quiet sobs. The cry of an infant broke through the air as he descended the stairs, a myriad of household objects lying along the floor. Adam moved quickly to the front doors, before turning back to face them. I'm going for help, he said, swallowing roughly as the air grew quiet. My uncle will know what to do, he explained, fidgeting nervously with the cloak around his shoulders. He could sense a wave of dread fall over the servants, a few whispers of doubt hanging in the air. I will come back for you, Adam said firmly, standing tall. I'm going to fix this, I promise. Minutes later, he rode quickly out of the gates on to Olive, Sir Giles clanking against his hip and cloak whipping against his back. The air was cool from early autumn, the forest floor a collage of reds, oranges and yellows. His uncle lived several days' journey away, but Adam wasn't worried about that. He had been reading maps for the last couple of years, and had plenty of money to make it there. It's going to be okay, he told himself, trying to keep his focus as he urged Olive on faster. Uncle will know what to... His thoughts were cut off by a sudden, terrible pain. Crying out, Adam felt himself flying from the saddle, falling to the ground in a heap before everything else went black. My lord? The prince blinked, staring up into golden branches. Prince Adam, are you all right? The boy groaned, rolling over onto his knees and blinking the stars away. His head was throbbing, bits of red dripping to the ground around his fingertips. He lifted his hand to his face feeling the stream of blood flowing from his nostrils. Master Adam, I'm all white, he said through his broken nose, looking back, at, looking back at the path for the cause of his fall. What happened, my lord? I don't know, he admitted, looking at the trees above. What the fit the branch? Let's return to the castle, the swordsman continued. We've barely, we're barely at the borders of the palace grounds. You can get that nose healed up before your journey. Adam sighed. Okay, he said in embarrassment, standing slowly and catching the sight of the horse further down the path. Olive, he called out, moving to gather the reins. Olive, come on, let's... He stopped suddenly in his tracks, his heart in his throat. Something was blocking his way. Something he couldn't see. He reached out, reached out feeling the invisible barrier with nervous fingers. What felt like a brick wall spread out in all directions, as low to the ground and as high as he could reach, at least. It felt similar to the force the witch had placed between him and his father not a fortnight earlier. No, not just familiar. It felt exactly like that. No, Adam breathed, dragging his fingers along the wall as he ran off the path, the barrier keeping him from moving any further out into the woods. No! He eventually coaxed Olive back to him and began riding along the barrier's edge, holding an arm out and trying desperately to feel for any break in the wall. Hours passed with no success. Prince Adam, Sir Giles said quietly as the dusk began to fall. Please, you're exhausted. We can continue this tomorrow. No, the boy huffed, giving the horse another kick as they descended to the steep cliff side. I have to. I have to find a way out. I promised to get help. He gasped suddenly as Olive nearly tripped over a root in the growing darkness. He tugged the reins tight to steady the horse on a narrow ledge off the mountainside. My lord, Sir, Jav Sir Giles started nervously. Please, I can't leave. Adam thought in anguish, sliding down slowly to the ground and reaching again for the invisible barrier. I'm... I'm sure someone will come for us soon, the sword said hopefully. She trapped me here, Adam thought, feeling his throat growing tight. She took Papa and she trapped me here. Please, my prince, let's go back to the... Sir Giles was cut off by the child's angry cry, small fists slamming against the invisible stone. The swordsman grew quiet in shock as the prince sank onto his knees in the mud, fighting against the unseen wall before him, screaming at the empty forest beyond. 
Not that Sir Giles could blame him, of course. Only, the child had only ever displayed eager curiosity when he was small, or a quiet sadness since the loss of his mother. Anger, though. Anger was new. End of flashback, line break. Bell watched as Adam brushed aside the snow and the dead vegetation behind it. They were on one of the more sparsely wooded sections of the forest. Shadows just starting to cross over the open area from the newly surrounding trees. All of them had, see had the same deep claw marks in their trunks that she had seen earlier. Bell heard something fall into the snow, glancing back to see Adam pulling several long beams of wood off a dark opening in the forest floor. Her eyes grew wide with interest, watching as he stood and brushed himself off before finally looking back at her. I'm going to make sure it's still stable, he said vaguely before lifting himself down into the opening and disappearing from sight. When he didn't return for several minutes, Belle started to grow concerned. Adam, she whispered, moving over and peeking into the hole. Adam, are you? She stopped as two blue eyes appeared in the darkness. I think we'll need some light, his voice echoed. She nodded, heart pounding with excitement now, as she ran to grab the lantern attached to Olive's saddle. Taking a few minutes to locate the spark rocks in their pack and light the wick. It's quite deep, Adam stated, face now illuminated by the lantern's glow, as she handed it down to him. His large body filled the entirety of the space, while a rope ladder hung beside him securing to some roots in the exposed earth. You'll have to climb down, but I'll be beneath you, so you need not fear falling, he explained, securing the lantern to his belt. Perhaps a few months ago, Bell would have felt uneasy going into a mystery hall in the ground with a man, not to mention one with thick claws and fangs. Papa would not approve, she thought with some amusement, though she herself felt no discomfort. Besides, she was far too curious to turn back now. I'm not afraid, she told Adam with confidence, stepping into the hole and gripping the old rope in both hands. Her sureness, however, was soon challenged by her inherent ineptness when it came to anything with a surface with unstable footing. The ladder was only secured from the top, the rest dangling below, the rope swaying awkwardly beneath her and slowing her progress. Belle felt her stomach lurch with each movement. Despite the lamp's light from below, it was still difficult to see the rungs, and she gasped several times as she missed her step. So sorry, she panted, breathing heavily as she tried to reorientate herself after her latest slip. In response, the light came suddenly closer, and she felt something warm brush her back. It's all right. It's my fault, Adam said, a smirk evident in his voice. I forgot you were clumsy. Adam was about to give an indignant retort when she felt his paw touch her back turning her gently to face him. Hold on to me, he breathed, suddenly serious. Belle stared at him, heart speeding up for a moment before she nodded, reaching out a still trembling hand, gripping his collar tightly. Her other, however, seemed unwilling to leave the safety of the ladder. You can't let go, he whispered, his voice even deeper than usual. Belle felt a large arm reach carefully beneath her in the small space. I've got you. Sucking in a deep breath, she closed her eyes and obeyed. To her relief, she felt immediately secure as he pulled her against him. Sitting in the crook of his arm, Adam's large paw held her carefully but firmly from beneath the knees, warm even through the thick winter socks and skirts. Belle realised she could have let go of his shoulders and still feel completely safe. But for some reason, her arms pulled her a little closer. Adam was still, breathing shallowly for a moment. Belle thought she felt the slightest brush of his thumb against her leg before swallowing roughly and continuing carefully down into the depths of the earth. They remained uncharacteristically silent as he climbed. He ignored the ladder's aid, instead simply climbing down the walls using his claws of his free three limbs. Without the need to focus on her task, Belle noticed one side of the tunnel was almost entirely flat, in contrast with the rough, uneven edges of the others. Looking closer, it almost appeared as if a brick-like pattern had been carved into its surface. Is that... the wall? Hmm. Adam hummed, his chest rumbling beneath her. I can't believe it's so deep, she breathed. How far down are we? 
He felt a small jolt run through him, realising they had hit the bottom. Deeper than any walls I've read about, he stated blankly. Letting her down to her feet, he unhooked the lamp from his belt and held it out in the open space. Here, a small room-like space had been carved away, the ceiling so low that Adam had to crouch on all fours to fit. Belle looked around. The walls were covered with flat panels of wood and a few dirty crates sitting in a corner. One wall, however, remained uncovered. Like the side of the tunnel they came down, it was completely flat. That same brick-like pattern carved into its surface. She looked at the panels along the floor beside it. Several deep brown stains in their surfaces. Blood, she realised in horror, remembering what Adam had told her. My claws just wear down when I try using them. She suddenly imagined a younger Adam, clawing desperately at the witch's barrier until his fingers bled. She imagined all the work it must have taken to dig so far down, likely done over years, only to find the wall still blocking his escape. Belle felt her throat growing tight, looking again at the large, deep stains in the wood. This was the last thing I tried, Adam said from beside her. She glanced over, noticing he rested a paw against the barrier, as if to make sure it was still there. He let his arm drop quickly, frowning but not seeming surprised as he crouched back on his hind legs. I'm convinced it goes straight to the centre of the earth. Belle reached out herself, fingers easily sliding through the wall of earth. She pulled a handful of dirt back, staring at it for a moment, before letting it fall to the ground. Strange how I'd envy you for that, he said lightly, as if anxious to lighten the mood. He sucked in a breath and huffed, a bit of fur from his eyes, looking back at the small space. There's another reason we came here, though. Really? She asked, following his gaze. There didn't seem to be much else here. I plan to make use of this place as a bunker of sorts. A bunker? Belle asked in surprise. But what for? He pursed his lips for a moment. You've been coming to the palace all this time, and no one's ever stopped you. Not really, Belle replied. I mean, a couple of people told me it was forbidden, but no one ever really seemed that concerned. She paused. I suppose there were some old signs to stay away, but I sort of ignored them. She shrugged. You came even though it was... He trailed off, grinning a bit. Actually, I am not surprised. Belle didn't notice his amusement. Instead, plucking up the courage to ask something she had wanted to for a while now. Adam, she started. Why, why did your uncle forbid anyone from coming here? His eyes grew immediately dark. My uncle? She flushed, realising her step. I, I meant King Victor, she admitted. He was quiet for a long moment. So you, um, know what I was, he stated. Belle nodded, slowly. I'm sorry. I sort of weaseled it out of someone. It was Sophie, wasn't it? Belle grimaced, though Adam didn't look upset. If anything, if anything, he seemed embarrassed. I'm still... I'm still just me, he said nervously, chewing the corner of his lip. Belle's mouth fell open, realising why he had never said anything. She had to bite back a smile. You were worried what I would think. You're the one who's friends with a peasant. <laughs> she laughed lightly. He only frowned. I don't care about that, he said adamantly. Besides, the entire class system is completely a creation of prideful, a very vicious men. It doesn't mean anything. Belle stared at him. What a peculiar prince, she thought in bewilderment. Though she couldn't help but smile at his idealism. She wondered absently how he'd come into such a mindset. He cleared his throat. So, Sophie told you about Victor too? He prodded. Oh, no. Belle said quickly, um, I sort of figured that out when I tried to look up you in a history book. The corner of his mouth finally twitched up at that. You tried to look me up? She flushed a bit. Yes, she admitted, but there was nothing there. I had to learn it from the bookseller. The king, well, he's silenced everyone regarding you and your father's existence. The, 
Bell heard a deep growl from Adam's chest. Of course he did. He snarled, the boss. He stopped himself, eyes growing wide as he looked back at her. So sorry. Bell didn't notice his slip, mind suddenly connecting the dots. King Alexander, the rightful ruler of this kingdom? He disappeared mysteriously a decade ago. King Victor initially declared his brother's death the act of a demon. As the bookseller's words rang in her mind, Belle finally connected the dots. She couldn't believe she hadn't realised this before. Adam, she breathed. King Victor? He knows about the curse, doesn't he? He frowned deeply, narrowing his eyes. Yes, he does. Okay, we're going into another flashback here, guys, and this... Wow. What Victor does here... Again, skip ahead. It's only a few minutes, but... Please, this is not pleasant. Winter had settled early that year for the first... Winter had settled early for the first year of the curse. Frost coating the insides of windowsills and flakes of snow creeping halfway into the rooms young Adam hadn't managed to seal tight. The castle held hundreds, probably thousands of windows, and one ten-year-old child could only manage so many on his own. Well done, my lord. This will take a bit of time, but it should build into a strong fire. Adam shivered, pulling the cloak further around his shoulders as he stared into the small fire he had managed to start on the hearth. He had spent nearly two hours trying to keep it lit, listening carefully to the direction of the bellows as he taught the child how it was done. Now burning, it barely provided any warmth, yet he reached out two small hands to take any of the life it offered for himself. The old fire iron trembling against the floor nearby, rolling back and forth but unable to move more than an inch either way. They would all learn how to move more effectively with time, but a few weeks was barely long enough to come to grips emotionally with the transformation, let alone try to take control of a strange new form. Adam shivered again. I'm so sorry, Prince Adam, the servant said quietly, voice laced with guilt. I'm so sorry. We all are, my lord. The bellows added, his deep voice wheezing from the object near Adam's knee. The boy shook his head quickly. Please, no more apologies. It's my fault I'm no good at this. You stay, he said, staring back at his sorry excuse for a fire. You shouldn't have ever needed to be, master, the old bellows said soberly. It was, it was our role in life, not yours. Adam frowned. Things have changed, he said simply. I'm just going to have to change too. Of course, still in possession of his human form. The prince couldn't have known how much change was still to come. He stared into the flames as they grew, the warmth finally reaching his arms and legs, burning the tips of his fingers. But he'd been so cold for so many hours, he didn't want to pull away. Living in northern France, even a prince wasn't immune to its winters, but there had always been a warm fire close at hand, to cast away the cold before it sank into his bones. Adam was so focused on the feeling returning to his toes that he didn't catch the sounds of several dozen horse hooves echoing from the forest until a small troop was at the gates. Eyes growing wide, Adam stood and raced towards the entrance. Shouts of alarm and confusion rang out from the servants as he passed. Prince Adam! Who is it? We are saved! Saved! Fool, what do you think they'll do when they find us like this? Adam froze in place hand resting against the large entryway doors. What will people do when the servants, if they find out? He wondered, until now, simply wishing for anyone to come for them, desperate for some distant relative or friend to come and make everything better. Everyone, he said, turning back in those, sh turning back to those in shouting distance. Everyone, please just, please just stay hidden until I can talk to them. He watched as those who could move found refuge in the shadows, the others resting still in place before swallowing roughly and pulling open the heavy door. The wind ripped through his cloak and Adam squinted against the winter sun as it reflected off of the thick white snow. Blinking, he saw the men at the gates, horses draped in the deep reds and golds, bearing flags with a family crest. A crest he recognised with aching relief. Uncle! Adam cried out rushing to unlock the gates with bare, trembling fingers, barely able to contain the joy in his chest as he pulled them open, watching the centre horseman dismount and pulling back his hood. Nephew! 
Prince Victor smiled. The man was still young, no more than thirty, his dark red moustache curling up warmly at the corners as he looked down at the child. He motioned for his men to head to stables before kneeling down in the snow and pulling Adam against his chest. My boy, where are your servants? They've quite neglected you, it seems. Uncle! Adam started, unable to hold back the tears any longer. They were... When she came, she she made them. And then, Papa! He was trying to swallow the sob in his throat. P Papa was... The man hugged the child tight, realising he couldn't say more. Come, you're as cold as ice. We'll speak inside, he said quickly, standing and wrapping an arm around his nephew as he pulled him into the dark castle. True to his orders, Adam's servants remained hidden. His uncle raised a brow at the strange assortment of objects, spotting the floors and shelves, but said nothing as they moved towards the study. I knew something had to have happened, the man said gently. Your father is always diligent in his letters. To go so long without a word, I was starting to worry. Adam couldn't seem to stop the moisture as it flowed free from his eyes. Someone came for me, he realised in shock. Uncle came for me. They entered the great office, where his small fire now roared with greater life, and Adam felt his uncle set him in an armchair and place a blanket around his shoulders. After several long minutes, the shock and cold wore away, and he looked up at the man, now seated across from him at the fire. My brother is dead, the older prince said, bluntly but gently. Adam shrugged, his tears over that long since dried up. I don't know, he admitted. And your servants? All dead? Adam shook his head quickly. No, they... He pursed his lips, before telling his uncle everything. About the witch's appearance, about turning his servants into objects, about his father... He's really gone, Prince Victor said, looking blankly at the carpet beneath his feet. He was quiet for a long moment before he spoke, his voice suddenly deeper than before. And you, his only heir. Adam felt his heart stop for a moment, looking up into his uncle's eyes. They had lost their warmth, his smile no longer comforting as he licked his lips. Uh, uncle, the boy asked nervously. What? What do you mean? The only reply was the sound of metal against metal as the older prince slid his sword slowly from its sheath. Adam's eyes grew wide, small frame quaking in fresh fear as he backed over the arm of the chair and, toward, and across the room. His uncle followed slowly, the sword reflecting the light of the fire that matched the sudden blood lost in the man's eyes. D don't! Adam cried helplessly tripping over a stack of books onto his back, staring up at the powerful man towering over him. To think it could be so easy, Prince Victor said to himself, watching the child with hungry eyes. To think I could walk in here a prince and walk out a king. Please, Adam begged, squeezing his eyes shut as he cowered in terror. P please, Uncle, don't! Stop! A voice cried out, and Adam peeked an eye open to see a golden object in the doorway, his flames rivalling the fire of the pit. Lumiere, Adam realised, unable to move in his shock, as his uncle stepped back, staring at the talking object. My God, you weren't lying then, Prince Victor breathed. Cogsworth waddled into the room beside him, trembling head to toe as he stood beside the old candle. Our master, no, never! He stopped, puffing up his wooden chest in courage. Our master never lies. This, this is the work of the devil, Victor said suddenly, nose curling up in the disgust as more of the mobile objects moved slowly, following suit and filling the room. The work of the devil, I say, he cried, the trembling sword in his hands betraying his fear. This, of course, did not pass Lumiere's notice. Need we call the kitchen knives as well, my lord, he said darkly. Or perhaps the armory. They haven't seen action in weeks. I'm sure they're anxious to be put to use again. Adam, of course, knew few of the servants would be of any use in a fair fight. If, as they were now, 
still inexperienced in their forms. Most are useless besides perhaps scratching the man's ankles. Though their slow movement into the room appeared ominous, it was really the fastest most of them could move at all. But of course his uncle didn't know that. Lumia was clearly bluffing. Prince Victor ground his teeth, eyes flashing in anger as he glared at the various objects. I have a troop of men at my command. Just in the yard, he threatened. Please, Prince Victor, there is no need for that. Lumiere went on, with all his usual gusto, though there was a slight darkness in his tone Adam had never heard before. Our master is no threat to you. He cannot leave the grounds, you see. Certainly there is no reason why he cannot be left alone. Adam's uncle ro- ro- Adam's uncle raised a brow, turning back to him. You cannot leave, he asked curiously. The boy shook his head, chest still filled with fear of the man he thought he had known. Prove it, Prince Victor snarled, dragging him to his feet and sliding the sword back into his sheath. Prove you are no threat to me. A half an hour later, Adam sat shivering in his saddle at the outskirts of the grounds. The path to the village ground fresh in the snow from his uncle's troops. Lumiere was tucked away in a satchel on his left, though Adam hadn't a clue what the candelabra planned to do if his uncle decided to murder him in the woods. Before them, the older prince watched without sympathy as Adam dismounted slowly and walked forwards, reaching a hand out. He felt the invisible wall beneath his palm, placing both hands against its cool surface and pressing it with all his might. A mime, a soldier called out in amusement, earning a few laughs from his comrades. Adam's eyes stung with grief, looking up with newfound fury at the only family he had left. Prince Victor scowled, dismounting on his own steed. Dismounting his own steed and moving quickly towards him through the falling snow. I'm not convinced, he said, reaching back through the barrier and grabbing the child's arm with strong fingers. Adam cried out in pain as he attempted to pull him through, his arms flying into a wall and skin breaking open at the contact. His uncle are... His uncle's eyes grew wide in his failed attempts. Hmm. You must be a very wicked child to deserve such a punishment, he said darkly, dropping the boy to his knees and turning his back to address his troops. King Alexander is dead, he announced with a loud voice. The men remained silent. They knew when to speak and when not to. My dear brother, a victim to a child possessed by the devil himself. Adam's head shot up. What? He cried, I didn't, as punishment for his crimes. God has cursed these grounds and its inhabitants. Victor went on, not acknowledging Adam's protests. For your safety, no one is to ever return to this place. Understood? Yes, your highness, the men cried as one. As they all turned to leave, Adam's uncle turned to face him once more. Do not worry, nephew, he smirked. I'll take good care of your kingdom for you. At that, he mounted his horse and rode into the front of his men, fully expecting his nephew dead from neglect within a year. Adam watched them leave, the snow growing heavy as the hoof falls faded into the distance. He let it pile atop his head and shoulders, staring at the road ahead until his vision began to blur. Prince Adam... Lumiere said anxiously from his satchel. The boy didn't move. All his strength sucked away from the cold and betrayal. I'm not a prince, he rasped. I, I'm no one now. Lumiere was quiet for a long moment. You are still our master, my lord, and we need you now more than ever. Adam bit his lip. Somehow more tears forming in his eyes. He blinked them away, curling his hands into fists as he slowly nodded. He took a deep breath. Let's, let's go home, Lumia. Yes, master, Lumia replied with soberness. Let's go home. And a flashback. So, Adam breathed, scratching the back of his neck awkwardly. On the bright side, I suppose my imprisonment here did save my life. In a way. I 
I can't believe he did that to you, Belle said quietly, only half hearing him. You were only a child. You, you were his family. Adam narrowed his eyes. When you know the aristocracy. Well, let's just say murdering a child in the way of the throne isn't so far-fetched, he said darkly. Belle frowned deeply, though she, what she had read in the library's history section certainly didn't contradict such a theme of violence. Anyway, he went on, I am certain Victor thinks me dead by now, and perhaps a decade has given him time to quell his fears about the enchantment. Belle's eyes grew wide. You don't mean... You don't think he'll come back, do you? She said in fear. He looked up, blue eyes dark and serious in the shadows of the underground room. I do. My castle is much grander than his. He'll certainly want it for himself. But, but you're stronger than him. He, he can't hurt you this time, she said anxiously. Adam's eyes softened a bit at her words. It's true that if he came alone, I could defeat him. Easily. He smirked, though the smile fell quickly. But he will certainly come with dozens of men. Hundreds, more likely. Even with the entire armory on my side. I fear we'll be at a disadvantage. Then, then, then you have to leave. Belle stopped quickly, glancing quickly back at the wall beside them. He can't, she remembered, heart sinking in her chest. Belle, he said seriously, if Victor comes through Monino, you have to promise to ride here immediately. Don't let his men get near your home before you leave. What? She asked in confusion. But I thought you said... Your town is the last stop on his route here, he explained. His expression grew dark. And my uncle and his men. They are known for taking what they want from the people. From the women in their path. Belle's chest grew tight as his meaning became clear. She couldn't even think straight enough to ask Adam how he could have known such a thing after being trapped here all these years. Instead, she only stared at him as the terrible implication of his words washed over her. Unable to speak, she nodded in agreement. He seemed to relax at that, crawling back to the opening they had come down. He turned back, holding out an arm. Belle moved over and reached around him, letting him pick her up once more, letting herself feel safe in his grasp. We'll make this place more functional, he went on, beginning the long climb back up towards the surface. Load it with supplies. Enough that you will have somewhere to safe until things calm down and you can escape. But what about you? I asked in confusion. Adam stopped in place. I will fight with the others, he stated. What? She gasped. No, I can't. I can't just coop myself up in here while you're all... Bell, we'll bring the fragile servants down here too, he explained straightly. Chip, Mrs. Potts, the dishes. Anyone who doesn't stand a chance above. Bell fell silent realising that Adam wasn't only trying to protect her. He was asking her to protect the others. How could she say no to that? It's only a precaution, and I doubt he'd even make the journey here any earlier than spring. Even if he does come this year at all, he continued. But, Belle, if I'm right, promise me you'll do this. Please. I promise, she agreed reluctantly. I just hope you're wrong. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that because lordy me. Okay, I know aristocracy and the killing of children, like Adam said, it's not uncommon in aristocracy. But, well, let's just say I want to punch someone. Otherwise, I really do like this chapter. It's just, you know, it's good. It fills in so much more of what's needed. And that barrier keeping him in oh my god i can't even imagine he's only 10 just oh my lord what can you do right anyway you guys know the drill like comment and subscribe hit that bell to get notified for whenever i upload a new video and remember to have a good day night or whatever time zone you're in bye my guys gals and non-binary pals i'll see you in another video bye